Good morning, everybody. How are you guys today? Good, good. Did anybody use their superhero powers this week? You did? Because you know we're superheroes, right? Yeah, look, I have my superhero shirt on. You know I'm a superhero, just like you guys? You know what makes me a superhero? I'm a Christian. Right? Yeah, we have superhero powers as Christians. Our secret identity is that we're Christians, but we don't really want that to be a secret, right? No. And some of our superhero powers are that we can love, and we can pray, and we can forgive. We can change the world with our actions. Do you guys know that? Absolutely. Pastor Mike's going to talk to us here a little bit about using our powers for the good. Because sometimes our powers, we have powers that can be bad and not for good. Yeah, we don't want those anymore, do we? We want to be fans. No, we want to be followers, not fans. Good, right? We have some very special things here that were made by one of our congregation members who is a superhero. Her name is Gloria Learmont. Bob, can you wave to us? Bob, wave. That's her husband. He has superhero powers too. But she made these in their prayer squares. So I want everybody to take one and use your superpowers this week, okay? Because you have the power of prayer that can change the world. Got it? So let's pray, and then we'll go back to our parents, and I'll let you have your prayer squares. Our Father, thank you for this beautiful day, this opportunity to come together to bring a new, 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 new loving friend into our family. Thank you for Cody. Thank you for his family. And thank you for the opportunity to use our superpowers. And everybody says, amen. Good job. Okay. Levi, come back. Come get a superpower square. How you doing this morning? Is there anybody out there? Is my microphone on? How are you doing this morning? Wasn't it wonderful to witness Cody's baptism and for all of us to be a part of that? I'm going to tell y'all, if that doesn't warm you, your wood's wet. We can't do much for you. That doesn't set you on fire. We've been talking for the last several weeks about being fans, not followers. And if you can have the first slide up for us, please. Remember that Jesus is not looking for fans. Jesus wants us to be followers. And the scripture that we're looking at for that is the next slide. Jesus said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. If we can have the third slide, I want you to remember what we learned last week. Fans settle for an easy commitment while followers surrender their whole lives to Jesus. And no, I didn't ride the bike yet, but I'm going to. Our scripture today comes to us from the book of the Old Testament prophet Zechariah. If you have your Bibles, you're welcome to follow along with me. If you don't, you're welcome to listen. I'm going to be reading from Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. (laughs) 
Then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up, like someone awakened from sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it. One is on the right of the bowl and the other is on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? He answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So the angel said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me and for me this morning? Gracious God, we are so thankful for the opportunity to be gathered together as a community of faith to worship you today. We're thankful, Lord, for the way that your Holy Spirit has worked through our gathering thus far, and we pray that your Spirit would continue to work among us. Lord, I pray that in the next few minutes that I might decrease in this place in order that Jesus Christ might increase. And I pray, Lord, that my words would be your words. And God, as always, we humbly ask that you would open our ears, open our minds, but most of all, dear God, open our hearts so that the words that you have for us today might be more for us than simply more information. Lord, you know we are bombarded by information on almost every side in our lives. But we pray today, Lord, that your words might be transforming to us, that they might give us transformation. And all this we ask, gracious God, in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we'd offer this prayer today, saying, Amen. Probably like many of you, I did not grow up being a hockey fan. As a matter of fact, in Middle Tennessee, other than a minor league hockey team that was in Nashville for a while, uh, uh, until recently, not many of us were hockey fans. But then, can we have the slide? The Nashville Predators come in, right? Bang finger. <laughs> Some of y'all are acting like you have no idea what I'm talking about, and I know you do. I know you do. I saw the jersey that you wore on Fan Sunday. It's interesting to me because I never really knew anything about hockey, never was interested in hockey, and then all of a sudden the Preds come to town and what happens to Tennesseans? We all become hockey fans. And one of the fascinating things about, about hockey, and one of the things I had to learn was this whole thing about the penalty and going to the penalty box. Now, I have to say in my life I have been in the penalty box, not on a hockey rink, but several times in my life. We called it time out, right? Standing in the corner, that kind of thing. But one of the fascinating things in hockey is that when somebody commits a penalty, they have to come off the floor and they go into the penalty box and instead of having five players, then you only have four. And that's what's called a power play, right? That's the power play. When your team has more players on the floor than the other team, and sometimes it's five, four, sometimes if it's been a really a uh, really uh, good fight or something. It might be 5-3 or 4-3. And there's a greater chance, a greater opportunity for scoring when there's a power play. I wish hockey was the only place I ever saw a power play. <laughs> I wish I'd never seen one in church. But I have. I've seen power plays in church, and so have you. I want to tell you a story. This is a true story about what happened to me in one of my first churches. As I got to this church, and when you're uh, a young pastor, and especially when you serve a small church, you don't have people like Bucky and Wendell and other people around to help you. You don't have a staff. You do everything yourself. So in this particular church, what I did was I gave out the offering plates. The ushers went out and took the offering. They gave them back to me. And I would usually turn around, face the altar, and I would raise them up. After about the third Sunday, I, I was at this church. As I was raising up the altars, I, I, was, I was raising up the offering plates, rather, at the altar, I noticed that 
right in the center, what I was looking at was a clock. And it made me stop for a minute because I thought, I'm, I'm raising up the offering in honor to Timex <laughs> or Bulova. And I thought, I never noticed the clock there before. So the next week I thought, I'm going to do something about this clock. I'm going to get this clock out of here. There was a closet over on this side of, of the sanctuary. And I went rambling around that closet. And I found this nice, beautiful gold cross. It was about this big. and had a chain on it. So I stood on one of the chairs. Don't try this at home, ladies and gentlemen. But I did stand on one of the chairs. I took the clock down. I put it in the closet. And I hung up this beautiful gold cross. And I did this on Friday. And I thought, this is going to be great. Well, this was the third church that I had on a charge, so I was always busting it to get there after preaching at the first two churches. So I come in, give the offering plates out. I'm standing there. They bring the offering back. I turn around, I raise it up, and there's the clock. <laughs> Some of you have already figured this out about me, but I'm pretty stubborn. And I thought, okay, I'll take care of this. I went into the church next week, I got the clock, and instead of just setting it in the closet this time, I buried it at the bottom of this pile of stuff, because I thought, we're not going to have the clock. I hung the cross back up, I thought everything is well, I bust into the church the next Sunday, don't pay attention to anything until I turn around with the offering plates and I look up and there's the clock again. <laughs> and I thought to myself, somebody really wants that clock up there. And I made a decision that day that I wasn't going to fight with folks about a clock. I just was not going to do that. But it reminds me of how quickly we as God's people can end up in conflict over the silliest, dumbest things. Doesn't it? We can. It's not just a local church. This happens on our uh, conference level, it happens on the denomination level, it, it, it happens on almost every level when we get groups of people together. Power plays. Power plays. In the scripture that I read to you from the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah has a vision. And in this vision he sees a lampstand with seven lamps on it. There are channels running to the lampstand, and at the top there's a bowl. In between the two lampstands, you'll remember there were olive trees. You'll probably remember that in the New Testament and Old Testament times that what they used for light were candles and lamps, and usually they burned oil, olive oil. Scholars believe that this lamp, because of the seven lights, would have been an extremely bright lamp. And that the symbolism here is that the people of Israel were supposed to be a bright light to everyone else around them. The problem is, is that the bowl that was at the top that was providing that, that was the bowl with the oil in it. And that represented God, the scholars believe. So when the angel says to Jeremiah, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, what he's really saying is, you've got to have oil in your lamps, and the oil that keeps you going is the spirit of God represented by the bowl. And without the spirit, you don't have very much. And this reminds us an important thing about fans and followers. We can have the next slide. Fans like to grab power and assert their control. Followers recognize that real power comes from the Holy Spirit. Fans like to grab power and assert their control. Followers recognize that real power comes not from control, not from getting your own way, not from bossing everybody else around. Real power comes from the Holy Spirit. It comes from the Holy Spirit. 
And this is really important for us to get today if we are to make this journey from being fans to followers. Folks, without the Holy Spirit, the church is at best a social group, a social club. Without the Holy Spirit leading and guiding us, we have nothing. Jesus said it this way, if we can have the next slide. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, then you will produce much fruit. But listen to this last phrase. Apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And brothers and sisters, when we get into power plays, when we want to assert control, we decide we want to be the ones to make the decisions rather than coming together as a group and listening to the Holy Spirit, we're going to be apart from Jesus. And it's clear that when we get apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. We can do nothing. So as followers, what we need to be doing is we need to be asking for the Holy Spirit to fall upon us, for the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us, for the Holy Spirit to be with us, because without the Holy Spirit, we don't have very much. It's much like the vision that was given to the prophet Zechariah. Without that bowl with the oil in it, the lamp can't be lit, it can't shine. Israel cannot be who they need to be, so says the prophet and the angel, unless they want to have the power of the Spirit with them. Now I know that you can think of times when, when churches have, have made silly, silly mistakes, when people have left because of things that really didn't make a whole lot of difference. It seems like every church that I've ever served had at least one example of, of somebody getting up and walking out and, and not coming back to the church because they didn't get their way. And Rehoboth, the last church I served, they, they had a conflict one time years ago because they, they had a little plaque up beside the wall, on the wall in the sanctuary, and they'd never put the offering up there. And the leaders, the elected leaders of the church and the clergy decided it would be good if they just put what the offering was up on this, uh, up on this board. Six people got up right in the middle of church and walked out because they were upset that the church would dare to put the offering up on the board. They didn't care about the attendance. Or what happened in so many people were in Sunday school, but how dare you put the offering up on that board? Wow. And then what happens to us is we become like petulant children, right? If you don't do what I want you to do, then I'm going to pick up my toys and go to another playground. And there's nothing sadder, brothers and sisters, to me than when we get into these arguments over silly things when we forget that it's not about what I want, what you want, what anybody else wants. It's really about what the Holy Spirit wants. And are we willing to be in prayer, to be listening to the Holy Spirit, or would we rather have a power play? Would we rather have our way or the highway? Now, many of you know that I was in the business world uh, for 10 years after I graduated college before I got the call to the ministry. And when I was in the business world, this is how it operated. I worked for, I was a store manager for Kroger for 10 years, and this is how it operated. There was no consensus. Things came down from the top, and it was kind of like this. It's either this way or the highway. You either do this or you no longer work here. And we see that in the business world. We see that in other arenas. But brothers and sisters, it shouldn't be that way for us. It shouldn't be that way for us. We should be guided by the Spirit. We should seek discernment. We should continue to talk to each other. And above all things, we ought to be able to agree to disagree. 
One of the funny things to me after 20, 20 plus years in the ministry is how many people think that I really uh, control things. They, they come to me and they say, you need to fix this, you need to make that. As if all I had to do was to be a benevolent despot and say, His Holiness Mike said so. And that's the way it's going to be. But it's not that way. And if anything, one of the things that I've learned over the years in ministry is that I have to be careful as a clergy person not to say, you need to do this because, by golly, I'm the clergy person. Did you go to seminary? Well, I did. Did you get ordained? Well, I did. Instead of seeking out the vision, the guidance, and the power of the Holy Spirit. So let us ask ourselves today, what do we really want for our church? Do we want our church to be guided by the Holy Spirit? Or do we want our church to be guided by power and control? This verse, the, the sixth verse of this chapter of Zechariah is one of my favorites. It reminds me, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I pray that we would be a people who are guided by the very spirit of God and that we would not, like fans, end up either in a power play or in a fight or cheering on the sidelines, go, 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 look at the trustees' chair, look at the staff parents' chair, the finance chair, look at them, go, go, go. Who do you think is going to win? But instead, that we would be people who always seek out the will of God as it comes to us through the Holy Spirit. Because it's not about power, it's not about might. But it is, brothers and sisters, about the Holy Spirit moving among us. And there are things that we could do together as a church by power and by might, by money, by work, by all sorts of human methods. But if we're not guided by the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, we don't have anything. So may we always be followers who understand it's not about might and power. It's not about control. It's about yielding to the Holy Spirit and letting the Holy Spirit guide us. Amen.